Hey there, it's Dr. Justin, and today's video is going to be on small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Is it real? Again, I've done a few videos on SIBO, and I'm hoping to make this one a little bit different than the last. So, SIBO is an acronym for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and I'm seeing a lot of patients coming into my office today with breath testing already completed. I'm even referring them out to get breath testing as well. But let's kind of break down SIBO and some of the constituents and some of the things I want to address in this video because I'm trying to be a little bit controversial in my title here because I'm having a lot of people that are thinking they have SIBO and they may have the symptoms of it. They may even test positive on the test for SIBO. But the question is, what is the root cause of the SIBO? So for instance, SIBO is a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So essentially we have specific bacteria in the colon. I'll just draw some bees here, for instance. The bees are, are symbolic for bacteria. And these bacteria are specifically in the colon area, right? So we have our stomach, which goes into our small intestines, which then goes into the colon on the left side, or I should say on the right side, and wraps in and around and down. So what happens is this overgrowth of bacteria here starts migrating upward into the small intestinal tract. And this is really important because this kind of bacteria is at home in the small intestine. And so what it does is it feeds off of specific nutrients, it produces a change in the pH, it spits off different bacteria, it affects the bacteria balance in the gut. And bacteria is so important. There's lots of studies when we reverse a lot of this bacteria imbalance, we see better blood sugar, we see less inflammation, we see better ileal sphincter tone here. This the sphincter right here, that's our ileal sphincter, right? The ileum of the small intestine, ilio cecal valve right there. And that actually gets tightened up. We have better blood sugar. We have less inflammation. We have better nutrient absorption. And again, good bacteria is important, right? Good bacteria eats poop and poops nutrition. Bad bacteria eats nutrition and poops poop. Essentially, good bacteria produces nutrition in your gut. Bad bacteria produces toxins in your gut. And when we have some bacteria migrating back to where they shouldn't be, that's going to be a problem. Okay, so how do we know the bacteria is in the right or wrong place? Well, we have specific tests. One test that I do a lot in my clinic is an organic acid test. And there's a couple of markers that we'll look at to see if we have imbalances in bacteria. We'll see theta hydroxybenzoate. We'll see methyl hipparate, we'll see delactate. These are all organic acid markers that the gut bacteria is off. And again, the, the disadvantage of a test like that, it doesn't tell us specifically where in the intestinal tract that bacteria is off. Now, it's a good general assumption that when you have someone with intestinal symptoms and they come back with an organic acid test with those markers off, that they probably have SIBO. That's true. But we want to be specific. And one of the tests that we typically do to be specific about SIBO is a breath test. And how that works is we're swallowing the solution of lactulose, which is a, a sugar that typically is undigested by our body unless bacteria digest it. So essentially, imagine this bacteria making its way in, through your intestinal tract. And it takes about 120 minutes for it to get to the area where it is typically eaten. And that's important because when we see a rise on this, what they call it a double peak pattern on a SIBO test, you see it peak up right at 120 minutes. That's a, usually a good sign for small intestinal and bacterial overgrowth. So 120 minutes is a really, really nice indicator because it gives us a window to exactly where in that intestinal tract that bacteria is being fed and the byproducts of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth are being measured. So what we're really measuring, we're measuring the exhaust. When we do SIBO testing, we're measuring methane, which is an exhaust, and hydrogen, which is an exhaust. So these are specific kinds of bacteria that produce methane and hydrogen. And now the nice thing is there's different symptomatic uh, presentation that you may see with abundant amounts of methane. We may see a lot more constipation in the individual. In hydrogen, we may see, with hydrogen dominance, we may see diarrhea, excessive diarrhea. And if we have both, we may see a, co a combination of alternating constipation and diarrhea. So it's nice to always look at the patient's presentation, what symptoms they're coming in with, and then seeing which pattern they dominate with. And again, if we're 12 or greater on the methane, that's a positive for methane on the SIBO test. And if we are 20 or greater on the hydrogen, that's a positive for being hydrogen dominant. And if we have a combination of two, that's also important. 
So really nice, we get a window exactly where that bacteria is a problem. Now, the issue is this bacteria may not be in the wrong spot because of a pure small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. There may be something else that's driving it. So let me just walk you through my line of thinking in this chalk talk here. So if we have, let's say, an infection, that infection could actually be driving that SIBO. And we may even have some dietary things affecting that as well. And we may even have some things such as hydrochloric acid, low HCL. And anytime we talk about low HCL, we automatically, automatically talk about enzymes because HCL is an enzyme activator. And if we're typically talking low HCL, we typically talk about bile salts too. A lot of times we'll have fat issues as well, so we'll see decreased bile salts. So again, you can see there's a, a lot of sequelae that may go into SIBO, but one of the most important things I find is a chronic infection. So if you're being treated with the, the, the rifaximin protocol or the neomycin protocol and you're still not getting better, my clinical experience, having treated a couple thousand patients over the last few years with these exact issues, is there's a deeper infection. I had two patients this last week where they tested positive for SIBO, one had blasto and one had giardia and actually a third had H. pylori. So it's really important, right? You can be chasing your tail in circles if you're just going after the SIBO and you're forgetting the deeper infection. So I really just wanna highlight everyone's attention to the infection. And I also wanna highlight just the other attributes that are really important involvement with SIBO. And you know, if we're doing an antibiotic protocol, neomycin or rifaximin, or if we're doing herbs like neem, various berberines, um, golden seal, uh, silver, um, oil of oregano, various herbs or nutrients or antimicrobials that we're rotating in, if, we're, if our diet's not good, if we're eating extra sugar, extra alcohol, extra gluten, you, you may not get better even with the best prescribed protocol. And even if your diet's really clean, let's say it's so-called paleo, but you have maybe these fermentable sugars like FODMAPs, these fermentable oligo, disaccharide, mono, and polyols, maybe like too much broccoli or garlic or onions, or things of that nature, that may be enough to prevent you from getting better as, as well. So I really want everyone to just kind of look at the holistic approach here, and I just want to make sure everyone's dialed in on the infection. So if you have a chronic gut issues, we really want to zone in on the infection first. And I typically do two different tests to rule out infections. You need to do two. I've seen one miss it from time to time. I do a genetic stool test that works very well and a multi-sample stool culture test. And these are very important because sometimes one will miss over the other. And this new genetic test I've been using for the last six months by DRG Laboratories is an excellent test as they've added a genetic sequence to it so you can be on probiotics, enzymes, bile acids, and even antimicrobial herbs, and it will still be able to test for the infection, which is nice, because many people I see, they, they can't come off their HCL or their enzymes or they get backed up. So it's another excellent way to look at and get a complete picture of what's going on. So what is SIBO? We have this migration of the bacteria back into the colon. And again, bacteria is like multitaskers, right? If we have too much, well, that's a problem, and it's, it's more of the out of balance. They're gonna be there, and they, they, either, they either multitask to one side or they go to the other side, and we wanna keep them the good stuff, the good stuff on the higher side, and the stuff that's dysbiotic or bad on the lower side. And if we do that with healthy diet, stress management, we're in good shape. If not, we wanna just see, our, is it just a run of the mill SIBO? Is it a quick diet change and some herbs and we're better, or do we have to go deeper? Sometimes we have to go deeper and we don't want to ignore the big barrier that may prevent us from healing. So again, parasites, bacteria, and or chronic fungal issues may be the underlying driving factor and your SIBO may be a symptom, not a cause, all right? SIBO may be a symptom, not a cause. So is SIBO real? Yes, the question is, is your digestive issue purely caused by SIBO or is it caused by a deeper underlying infection? and or other factors, diet, HCL, enzyme, bile salts, stress, and other things that aren't being addressed along with that. So again, feel free and check out my other videos on SIBO, very beneficial. And if you need more help addressing your chronic gut issues, fatigue, or any other chronic health challenges, click on screen or click below. And again, subscribe to my videos. 
We have thousands of subscribers now, so sharing is caring. If you guys enjoy these videos, keep on sharing them with your friends and family. And thanks. Have a great night.